God of War 2 came out on the PlayStation 2 two years after the first God of War, with the game being another commercial and critical success for Sony, where at the time it was deemed as the greatest entry in the franchise. But here lies the question, is God of War 2 still worth playing after 16 whole years? Stick with this video to the end to find out, starting with... The game picks up right after the ending of God of War 1 with Kratos as the new God of War, after the death of Ares by the ghost of Sparta, who is being a much worse warmonger than his dead slave master, he even managed to have the entire army of Sparta by his side pulling up a whole invasion on Greece, as an act of revenge on the Olympians for refusing to erase his haunted memories. Athena tries to warn Kratos that she's losing ammo to defend him from Olympus's wrath, but Kratos being understandably pissed to his core brushes Athena's warning off to immediately jump into the city of Rhodes, not her city but I see where you're going with this, to help his Spartan army tag the territory, the takeover is going as planned, till a random eagle pops into the picture, zapping the new god of war, taking away his newfound power, shrinking him down to human size, while shifting that power over to the Colossus of Rhodes, making the statue come to life to kill the titular protagonist. Amongst all of the shenanigans going on, Zeus from the kindness of his heart drops in the Blade of Olympus the sword he once used to one-shot the titans of the Great War, with a catch. Kratos has to pour in all of what's left of his godly powers into the sword, depowering him to mortality. Kratos tears the Colossus down like it's no one's business, that then hype himself up to all the other gods about how much of a giga chat he is, to get squashed by the hand of the Colossus. The large sword is yeeted out of his hands, so he finds himself beaten to an inch of his life, realizing that he needs to grab a hold of it for his own sake. Kratos finds himself limping slowly towards it, so plot twist, the evil was Zeus all along, where he's like, crap, you're doing the same shit we wanted Ares dead for, but worse, but I'll give you this one chance to serve us again. Deal. Kratos understandably tells Zeus to shove it up his tailpipe. Knowing that the Olympians aren't really trustworthy, Zeus stabs him with the big blue sword. He ends up back in Hades for like, what, the third time at this point? Till we get the identity of the narrator of the franchise, the Titan of Earth Gaia, who helps heal his stab wound, Kratos being, well, Kratos, crawls out of hell like it was nothing. So the adventure begins to reach the Sisters of Fate to go back in time to get the Blade of Olympus back to stab the King of Olympus straight through the heart. In this plot, we see the angry Kratos who known the Greek games, but he ain't on full throttle yet. It's only in the middle of the downward spiral of madness, where you can tell from the beginning that the ghost of Sparta has had enough of the Olympians breaking their promises and lying to his face over and over again. Trust me. We'll get to you at a later date. No wonder he's trying to take away all the territory that he can't take away from those who took advantage of him, venting out all of his frustrations through conquest and warfare. But the very moment he gets tricked by Zeus to see him wipe out his entire Spartan army, that's when Kratos finally snaps, with the undying resolve to kill the God of Lightning. But he's not actively seeking to kill any of the other Olympians or gods. He only wants to finish off Zeus. Most of the major boss killings that happen around here is mainly them being an obstacle in Kratos' way. Like they were asking for it, the ghost of Sparta still has a lot of sadness with remorsefulness coursing inside of him by the mount of regret from the death of his wife and daughter. While caring heavily for his men, evident by the last Spartan character who managed to survive Zeus' attack. The point where Kratos gets balls to the walls pissed is when he finds himself fighting off the one shadowy soldier till it's revealed it was the last Spartan dead by his hand. In his last moments, he lets Kratos know that Zeus, out of spite, ended up nuking Sparta with his lightning. Wait, wait, hold up. This dude managed to survive a blast from Zeus twice, while well, hot to him. That's impressive, actually. So it's at that moment where Kratos finally breaks down to almost say he's completely done with this shit in the first half of the Kraken boss fight by switching the face buttons into a tantrum of anger to call Zeus to fight him head on or cursing his very own existence till Gaia comes into his own mind as his dead wife fueling his rage towards the King of Olympus. In an overall sense, the Kratos you have in this game is still a heavily broken man who has been cheated after fulfilling his end of the bargain, only to get nothing in return, to lose everything yet again, making him go further into a maddening rage, adding to the complexity of his own character. Something that is a welcomed addition to the game's plot is the expansion of the God of War lore, introducing the Titans along with the origins of the whole world by the prophecy of Kronos, yeah, the Titan who had the temple from the first 
first game on his backside, eating his kids so none of them would kill him, so his wife, don't ask how they had kids, just roll with it, hides the last child who turns out to be Zeus to be sent on a remote island that's actually Gaia. She raised him till he grew up as a ripped Greek god. During that time, his hatred for Kronos was growing, then the Titan War happened. Extensive lore like this makes the world feel a lot more lively, with the Pantheon oozing deep history. This title also has a crap ton of Giga Chat Kratos moments, with one being a direct callback to the first game when he met the Barbarian King again, along with the back and forth with Theseus. Hey look, Perseus made his way into the game. He's even voiced by the same actor who played him in the Clash of the Titans movie that inspired the series. I bet the character will be treated with the utmost respect that he needs, right? <laughs> Fatality. Moving on to one of the most badass moments ever when Kratos kills fate in destiny itself. So goddamn cool. But for as well written as God of War 2's narrative is, the game comes with plot holes the size of Texas. For one, how in the hell does Atlas have a challenge in God of War 1? While surprised, he was trapped in Tartarus the entire time, and Kratos was the one who chained him all along. I'll get to you soon, buddy. Don't worry. Plot hole number two. Spoiler warning, in the game's ending, Kratos can now go back in time. He does so coming real close to killing Zeus. Athena moves in as a human shield to save Lightning Rod to stop Olympus from collapsing because both are one and the same. Oh, by the way, Kratos was one of Zeus's many bastard kids all along. Despite the death of Zeus meaning the end of Olympus as we know it, he wants to do it anyways. So the ghost of Sparta goes back in time to the Titan War, uniting all of the Titans, starting a war against a recovered Zeus. Okay, the ending is an epic as fuck climax that gets you hyped for God of War 3. But since Kratos has a much easier time going back to the past than Samurai Jack ever did, he could have gone back to the point in time where Athena got in the way to defend the King of Olympus, shoved her out of the way to finish the job, even if he needed this one specific chamber to do so. Or he could have gone back to the point where he was stabbed with the blade of Olympus to backstab Zeus with the one he has, and boom, mission complete. Here's an option 3 for you. How about going back in time to the night of the death of your family to stop yourself from killing them? That plot hole could have been fixed in so many different ways. However, in spite of these plot holes, God of War 2's narrative is a really well told story that shows the betrayal part of Kratos' path of vengeance and developing his character at the same time, while fleshing out the rest of the God of War world. But no matter how well a game tells a story, nothing will trump the most important aspect and that's the gameplay. Athena! You will suffer for this! God of War 2's gameplay loop hasn't changed very much from the last time around being a hack and slash game with an equal amount of combat puzzles and platforming. But it's actually a direct sequel that improves on these core mechanics, unlike other direct sequels that we all know. Get out of here. Since the game was directed by Cory Balrog, who worked with David Jaffe on the first game, so by then the dude knows what made God of War God of War. So the game has seen a major overhaul to the combat, sure, you still got the whole light heavy attack setup, on the other hand, the combat feels a lot more satisfying while also being more frantic than the first. By having Kratos move much faster than he did in the last adventure, I'd even say that hitting one enemy feels a lot meatier than it did in God of War 1. With the introduction of some heavier enemies that you'll be fighting throughout the journey, oh, and one thing that makes the fighting system a much bigger improvement over its predecessor is that sweet juicy weapon variety. Yup, God of War 2 did some the first should have put into consideration, giving the Ghost of Sparta a variety of toys to play around with that come with their own unique properties and movesets. Starting off with the Golden Blades of Athena, replacing the Blades of Chaos from the last title, it's pretty much two blades attached to chains that Kratos regularly throws around, but in this game they're more optimized for stylish play by giving it an air wave looking move and even a million staff variant along with its ability to yank and slam enemies to the ground. Next up we got the Barbarian's Hammer that Kratos has politely borrowed from the aforementioned Barbarian King. Uh, right? Okay, moving on. The hammer is pretty much the slow heavy hitter that dishes out a ton of damage to enemies. Along with shock damage, here's the kicker. You can summon souls with this thing to help you in battle, just like the souls of Hades from the last game. But it comes up after every attack, with the downside being the lack of the roll ability. Yeah, you cannot roll with this weapon whatsoever. Remember when I said they should have given our Spartan friend the spear to play around with? Well, I'm happy to report that someone over at Santa Monica had the same idea, blessing us with the Spear of Destiny. 
This thing is a dream to use. It has quick lightning attacks, wide area sweeps. Best part is that it has been projectiles that Kratos shoots out like shotgun blasts. After each move or separately, it even comes with the option of planting bombs on unsuspecting targets, making the spear great for crowd control that comes with a lot of stylish juggling potential. Last but not least, we have the legendary Blade of Olympus, a giant sword used by Zeus to end the Great Titan War. I just gotta say, man, the sword definitely packs one hell of a punch with its crazy strong swipes, plus the ability to shoot lightning after every single strike. Man, the greatsword is such a beauty to use while smacking the living daylights out of the Greek pantheon. So with that being said, Santa Monica actually followed up on providing Kratos with some wonderful toys of destruction, bringing up the combat options you have in God of War 2, while massively bumping up the combo potential on offer. You might be thinking, if Kratos is going against the Olympian gods, then he has no magic, right? Wrong. He's got Titan magic this time around after switching sides, starting off with the Typhon's Bane a wind bow that shoots out wind arrows in rapid fire succession that can fire charge shots for massive AOE tornadoes. I mean, imagine having a method of offense that includes shooting out tornadoes and hurricanes from a bow just to send everybody flying. Let's face the facts, this one is much better than the Zeus Lightning from the last game because it has a much faster fire rate it also feels really damn good to blast something with. The wind arrows, I would even say they're good for juggling dudes, making the Typhon's Bane God of War's Ebony and Ivory with Hurricane Blast. Remember the Rage of Poseidon from God of War 1? Well, instead we got the Rage of Kronos, acting as a AoE lightning attack to zap all the enemies on screen. It's more of a taser just pushing L2 electrocutes nearby adversaries. If it's casted far from the creature you want to tase, a mini spark comes up. It doesn't really do anything, but if you tase the right target, then you'll tase him and his buddies, giving the Ghost of Sparta free reign to move about, to get a few combos in, or open up a hell for mana chest. I'd go so far to say that this is a lot better than T-posing while spinning around in place, due to the spell's flexibility of movement, allowing you to pull off more devastating combos. One spell that made it over from the previous game is the Medusa had now dubbed the Head of Eurelee, obtained by, you guessed it, the forceful, unsensual, grotesque decapitation that'll scare the living daylights out of Karen Wojcicki. Man, I love this franchise. It's an upgraded version of the severed head. It still freezes enemies in place, turning them to stone, giving you the free hits that you need. With a couple of new tricks to boot, you can now freeze Gorgons, making it very game and a lot easier to deal with the Medusa clones. Instead of holding the square button to slowly petrify the enemy, you can now shotgun blast the ray to instantly freeze anybody giving you a hard time. Now I'm starting to wonder if Corey had a thing for shotguns because my lord there is a ton of weapons and magic that just exude a ton of boomstick energy. Or maybe he had Evil Dead in mind while making this game. Now the head can petrify multiple groups of enemies through a massive petrification explosion, allowing you to crush a massive horde of enemies this time around. The force spell will not be complete without a massive screen clearer, and trust me, this next one is bonkers. I bring you the Earthquake of Atlas, obtained from this title's plot hole, where the L2 button is just Kratos, gamer rage stomping, while huge chunks of the earth break apart, smashing everything in sight, killing everything that stands in the Spartan's path of unadulterated vengeance. In the same way you probably raged on Melania after the 99th attempt. On the topic of Bots of Anger, the God of War Devil Trigger variant makes a return, but instead of the Rage of the Gods, it's the Rage of the Titans. Fitting in with the change in Allegiance, once activated, it'll make a lot of your attacks much stronger. This time, on the other hand, Gaia actually made it a whole lot more manageable. Instead of having no way to turn it off whatsoever, like Rage of the Gods, Titan Rage can be switched on or off. The way it was supposed to be done, making it a resource that could be saved up for tougher encounters to be recharged in the middle of a fight either through a more offensive playstyle or by picking up the new gold orbs to replenish the rage meter. In this title, you will spend as much time solving puzzles and platforming as you do in combat. Even that has seen a few quality of life improvements. Remember in the first God of War when you were climbing around, whenever you wanted to go down you had to manually move the left analog stick in the direction? Well in God of War 2 you can push L1 to slide down the wall, reaching ground level in no time. Oh, remember when you had to catch rope to swing while pushing buttons for momentum? Well in this entry, Kratos is Spider-Man, no joke, when he's not smashing people's heads in with the blades of Athena. He uses them like web shooters, on different grapple points available, with him swinging vertically or going into a 360 arc, 
or at some point zipping around. Hell, in this game there's literally an entire set piece dedicated to this one mechanic. It's like they wanted to make a Spider-Man game but they didn't have the license for it. Later on in the revenge mission, Kratos meets a crack-headed Icarus to hijack them wings to help clear longer distance gaps. Through gliding, you'll find yourself using heavy winds to get to higher platforms flapping them wings. As for the puzzle segments, it's still the whole move the block to this one tile mixed in with the switch pulling to open up a specific door, bringing in one twist to shake things up. The Amulet of Fate, giving the Ghost of Sparta Quicksilver style allowing him to slow down time to crawl. Whenever a green glowing fate statue is present, to keep doors open, having platforms stay in place, it can even be used in combat to make you faster than the other enemies, on screen giving you the opportunity to experiment with the other combo options on offer, even making a few annoying enemy types easier to handle. On the topic of making things easier, let's talk difficulty. God of War 2 isn't the hardest game out there by a long shot, however it packs a pretty decent punch, having the creatures that you fight come at you in hordes, trying to gang up on you, as the player will be attacked by groups of enemies all at once. Hope that you know when to dodge and block. Even blocking has been upgraded this time around. Enter the Golden Fleece Armor that allows you to perfect parry an enemy. Once the parry has been pulled off, you'll find yourself countering the attack, dealing the same amount of damage that would have been dealt to you. Hmm, I'm starting to see where the inspiration is coming from. Good choice, Corey. Good choice indeed. To anyone saying God of War 2 is a mindless button masher, I just gotta ask. Bruh, have you even played it? If you mindlessly button mash, you'll get your face kicked in with these guys who require you to be strategic in how you approach them. They can block, evade, or even slap you around if you only use square square triangle on them. Remember how God of War only had three major boss fights? Well, God of War 2 is packed to the brim with hella boss fights. Really good ones too. With the Colossus of Rhodes, no relation, being one of the only hand gimmick fights done right being one hell of a spectacle. Enter the best decision this game took with its fights, making a majority of them your size. With guys like Theseus where you feel like you're fighting off another player with a completely different playstyle to yours. The same goes for guys like the Barbarian King and even Persis, but that invisibility helmet needs to go out the window fam. The pre-ultimate fight of the two sisters of fate is a main highlight of the boss lineup with the Laxus fight demanding you to think strategically about your offense and defense. It even offers up a fun array of verticality. Even the other sister Atropos offering a jaw dropping what the fuck moment by taking you back in time to God of War 1's events where Kratos fights Ares to prevent the stone bridge from cracking or the ghost of Sparta will be no more. Despite God of War 2 being a massive improvement over the first game it comes with its own set of issues. For every well thought out boss fight, there is equally an underwhelming boss waiting around in the corner, with the third sister of fate Kloto being a major letdown. I just finished one of the game's highlight boss fights, with the two sisters who are less powerful mind you, the most powerful sister only amounts to a few switches followed up by a quick time event. Disappointing. God of War 2 is the start of the intrusive QTE implementation that has stained the series legacy. You still have the QTEs that are completely optional which is used to fill up a resource like health, mana and rage. On the other side of the coin, you get tricked into watching a cutscene, then random buttons show up on screen and you're expected to push them. As soon as they pop up, at least everyone's favorite QTE sequence still makes a return. The set pieces in this title are top notch a lot of the time, but the game has a few stinkers. Like this one set piece with a spiked ceiling raining down on your ass, quickly mind you, in a room filled with skeletons that take some time to definitively kill, that crushes you every time, along with that goddamn phoenix puzzle with a large ass flame that's constantly deep frying you with harpies and soldier dudes. Other than that, God of War 2's gameplay is a huge step up above the original that maintains the core of what made the combat great in the first place, while adding some much needed quality of life innovations that makes the game a whole lot more fun to play in all honesty. Hidden deep within the spire lie the sisters. They control the threads of fate.
The graphical fidelity in God of War 2 is a step up from God of War 1, having more detailed character models and creature designs that look less polygonated than the character models in its predecessor, while featuring some of the best variety of locales I've ever seen in a PS2 action game. With the island of creation that features a ton of unique looking castles, forests, and chambers that look really distinct from one another, making it feel like you're heading into more than one location. The OST this time around goes much harder with the bombastic melodies since we're literally at the start of Kratos' villain arc. Most of these tracks are much more violent sounding in nature, as the operatic sound soars through the speakers while Kratos goes on more of a rampage. Through the island of creation, so God of War 2 is a complete step up from God of War 1 in the visual department using the PS2's processing power to its apex. The sisters are dead. God of War 2 is one of the raddest sequels to a video game I've ever played, so I'll slap dash it with that triple S rank. It's one of those games that just kicks its predecessor's ass on almost all fronts. Despite the title's faults, it sits among one of my favorite sequels of all time, with its well-told tale of betrayal and revenge, along with its enhanced gameplay mechanics, makes God of War 2 one of the PlayStation 2's finest titles. That is worth playing in 2023, especially if you are a fan of the character action genre. After God of War 2's critical and commercial success, two games in Sony's new hit franchise were being worked on, with one being a prequel game to go on Sony's new handheld console at the time, while the proper sequel was the juggernaut to be released on their old powerful PlayStation Station 3, so be sure to like and subscribe, hit that notification bell to find out if God of War Chains of Olympus still holds up to this day. This has been the Devil Joe signing out. <laughs>